Good morning, everybody. Greetings from London. It is such a pleasure to be here with you today with so many teachers and to have this opportunity to, to share my projects with you. I've prepared a fully illustrated talk for you today, so I hope you can just sit back and relax and enjoy the images, come along on the journey. Maybe grab yourself a cup of tea or a cup of coffee. My path to this, this moment has been um, a happily varied one. I completed a, a degree, an undergraduate degree in physics, a four year degree. And after that worked in IT consulting for a while. And then I uh, studied fine art painting for four years. And it was after graduating from that degree that I asked myself, well, what do I want to do with these new skills, with this new art? knowledge and I felt passionately that I wanted to do something optimistic, um, something generous that said something um, about um, some of the more special aspects of what it is to be human and I asked myself well what would happen if I returned to the world of physics? Might I see the subject with fresh eyes and maybe find opportunities to create visualizations of some of the more hidden aspects of nature that scientists understand and find interesting and beautiful that might be a little bit more hidden from, from the rest of us. So my plan for today is really simple and it is just to share with you my first impressions of physics and physicists as I return to that world and then to move on to explain how I use art to explore and share some of the beautiful things that, that we've discovered. So with no further ado, let's, uh, let's get going. So this is where we begin in 2011 in the physics department of Imperial College in London. And the, the college is located in the Magenta box here next to the beautiful Hyde Park and many great museums. We have the Science Museum and the Natural History Museum and the Victorian Albert Museum. Um, and thanks to the vision of Prince Albert and Queen Victoria in the, 19, in the 1850s, we are also neighbours to the Royal Colleges of Music and Art and the Royal Albert Hall. So you can see that the campus is a celebration of science and the arts and a perfect place for a project like this. And the physics department is just where the magenta star is. And um, it was built, this particular building, the current building was built around 60 years ago. It's called the Blackett Building. And it's named after the Nobel Prize winner, Patrick Blackett, who was running the department at the time. And inside the building, there is this great staircase through which the life of the department has flown, has flowed for 60 years. And this then is me at the beginning of my journey, wondering where my project is going to take me. And I began right at the bottom of the stairwell in the subterranean basement. Behind doors marked with flashing warning signs, I found a world that looked like, like this. And this is an experiment to produce some of the world's shortest and most powerful light pulses. Light pulses that are around a millionth of a billionth of a second long with the power of over 100 power stations. In this lab, the electric dipole moment of the tiny particle that we call the electron is being measured. And actually, it turns out uh, you can think of the electric dipole moment as the electron's shape. And it turns out that the, the electron's shape is um, understanding that has vital implications for our understanding of the history of the universe and actually even for our own existence. And the work that the team are doing in, in this laboratory is incredibly, is, is done to extraordinary accuracies. And I remember being struck just by the work done to create highly controlled 
environments. I traveled three floors up and I joined the students in the hubbub of lectures. And it was an incredibly familiar and also distant experience. Time had given me a little space in which to observe. And as I didn't have the exam pressure of the students sitting next to me, I found I could go along for the sheer fun and interest. I observed how amazing ideas are chalked up speedily, often with little discussion and in seemingly to so many of us, incomprehensible and dense language. Lecturers drew interesting diagrams and graphs, some with the potential to be quite beautiful. And as soon as they were realized, were often erased with the flick of a wrist. At times, the lecturers seemed to dance and almost inhabit a, a world of their own. In interludes, students formed cues to discuss questions and, and ideas. And infinitely tiny things like here, the interactions inside the nucleus of the atom are made huge. And vast things like our sun made relatively small. Such is the travel of, of the human imagination. And as lectures unfurled, I was actually quite often struck by how sometimes marvelous, astounding, mind expanding ideas were presented rather, rather prosaically. And in group meetings like this one, this is a group of quantum information theorists. Every Wednesday morning, they would have a Wednesday morning breakfast meeting. Um, there is breakfast and great seriousness. As I traveled through the building, I met many souls. On level five are particle physicists considering the building blocks of the world. On level six are fusion people. On level eight, light is manipulated to create invisibility and the sun's energy harnessed. On levels 10 and 11, the occupants' gazes are directed towards our sun, the heavens, and far back to the beginning of time. I remember, I rem remember very well marveling at our curiosity, creativity, and perseverance. And I recall having this notion of a bright point of consciousness looking out at the universe. I made a small collection of physicists notes and they were on anything that came to hand. So I think this might be an idea for small reversals in the arrow of time written on a napkin. And on a receipt, musings over the expansion of the universe at the beginning of time. The path of a particle on some conference proceedings and the annihilation of matter to make light on a coffee cup holder. And I put these little uh, snippets into a small film called Writing, uh, which was a, a kind of reflection on the scientific process. As I chatted with physicists of many types, I appreciated their, their varied ways of looking at the world. And I enjoyed how in a single conversation, we often looked at something from several perspectives. And we were always conscious of, of trying to find the best picture. And this flexibility of thinking seems, seems valuable. And I began to think of their glasses as, as metaphors for this diversity of viewpoints. I had good fortune at the beginning of my project to meet a theoretical physicist called Terry Rudolph. And we applied for an, aw for an award from the Leverhulme Trust. And this organization supports interdisciplinary working and gave us the support we needed to begin work seriously. And in our first meetings in his convivial and colorful office, Terry would often share his ideas by writing on the window and you can just see some of his 
his writing here. And this inspired me to think of physics as holding patterns up against nature. Thinking of the window and also of the physicist's glasses, I made this small oil painting on Japanese paper called The Physicist. And I decided to call my project Finding Patterns, a name that, um, that feels fitting even now, 10 years, uh, almost 10 years later. And I built a website to share my experiences and projects. So please do visit it and, and get in touch. So the window is a surface upon which to draw nature's patterns. And it's also the aperture that lets in the light. And by studying the world through science, we do let in the light. In 2013, we built a little cinema in a yurt powered purely by sunlight. And here is the beautiful structure inside. We took a domestic light piping system and an old LC, LCD screen from a defunct computer. And we made a projection system and fitted it over the circle of light. And here is our prototype high up on the roof of the physics department with the Albert Hall over on the left in, in very pleasing symmetry. And on the top of the yurt, are uh, experimental organic solar cells from the Technical University of Denmark, and they're harvesting energy for, for dull days. And we took the, the Sun Cinema to festivals as visitors peered into the blackness, images sometimes barely discernible, hovered in space on a low circular tabletop. And every passing cloud dimmed our image, just as nature in all our experiments holds the upper hand. However, when needed, we, we cleverly release the stored daylight from the organic, uh, that were harvested by the organic solar cells. And people of all ages enjoyed the show. Nature seems to reuse great ideas and we with our pattern seeking imagination see familiar phenomena popping up again and again in diverse places. And many are related to this simple idea. The idea of the harmonic oscillator it seems so intuitive. We give it a nudge and it travels upwards, runs out of momentum and falls back only to overshoot and so on and, and so on. And here, these two sweet oscillators suspended from a shared cotton thread talk because they share the same length and are resonant neighbors. And this pendulum motion is perfectly captured by a uniformly rotating wheel seen sideways on. And so in physics, we often use the mathematics of rotating circles to describe nature's myriad oscillations. And as we observe the displacement of the pendulum over time and travel downwards, we can record the result as a wave. And this is a design that I call harmony. And oscillators are everywhere in nature. Uh, we live in a universe that dances with vibrations at every scale. And so here they are in an oil painting. And we start at the bottom with the longest vibrations representing the great pressure waves of matter and light at the beginning of time. And as you travel up through the painting, we have the oscillations of our sun, the sun cycles, the earth years and days, the beating of the human heart, the sound of our voices, the beating of quartz crystals, and the unimaginably fast oscillations of light. And there are over 6,000 painted dashes. 
Since 2018, we've been designing and creating workshops for children and young people about important things. Uh, the minds of children are aged around eight to 10 years old seem so, seem to me so fearless, curious, imaginative and joyful um, and tuned to embrace and celebrate big ideas and vast variations in scale. I feel that there's a great opportunity to share beautiful, challenging and important ideas with them that go far beyond the UK teaching syllabus. And so we began with the tiny particles that make up the world and developed this workshop about atoms. The sessions are a celebration of diverse activities that blend art and science seamlessly. To develop the programme, we had the good fortune of the help and encouragement of a small number of teachers in London who coached us and actually really luckily let us experiment with their children. And we begin every Atom Day by capturing the children's questions. And this also helps us gauge where they are with their thinking and gives us a benchmark. And at the end of the day, we return to these questions and our aim is that um, hopefully they will be able to answer most of them themselves. We explore, well, we begin by exploring the history of thinking about atoms. We think about Brownian motion and actually do a demo with a, a beach ball with our fingers as jiggling atoms. And we ask how many atoms are in this small one centimeter cube of metal. We have great fun as everyone has a guess at the number. And the answer is totally fantastic that there are as many atoms in a one centimeter cube as met of metal as stars in the visible universe. And this number is one with 24 zeros, one septillion. So we hold the universe beneath our fingertips. And we consider how atoms make up the entire world and the students make artworks to express this idea. Collages inspired by Henry Matisse. So here we have our sun in a cool blue sky. And you can see the atomic makeup of the sun and the cool sky in the key here on the left hand side. And here we have a tree and seawater manifested as a strange sea creature. And these designs become covers of a small atom book folded from a single sheet of paper. Here is a page about helium, its content, two protons and two electrons and its spectrum. And the children come up with so many diverse ways to express what they've learned. And you've seen that um, from the books that we investigate atomic spectra and we think of every atom as a tiny musical instrument with a particular song of light notes. And using handheld spectroscopes, the children study atomic spectra and identify the atoms that made them. We go on to continue the musical analogy um, and the children make beautiful patterns by vibrating flat metal plates mounted on a metal stick with a violin bow and that's just salts or sands scattered on the top there. So you see similar vibrations on, on the tops of drums. And this in fact is the exact same experiment created by the musician scientist Ernst Kladny in the late 18th century. Um, and the one that was in fact very popular in the court of Napoleon. And we learn that around 100 years later, with the advent of quantum mechanics, we discover similar vibration patterns inside atoms. And here is a set for a particular energy of hydrogen. And it is a wonderful moment when the children discover these 
and celebrate the beauty of them. And we talk about the things that they remind us of, like flowers and fruits and butterflies. We go on to ask, how are the atomic spectra created? And the musical parallel continues as children become electrons and dance as they absorb and emit different colors of light. They dance vigorously for blue light and return to rest as it vanishes and then dance again sleepily for low energy red. And again, this time at a medium tempo for green. And we, had, we actually had one very um, fun evening spent with a youth club over Zoom and each participant used the Zoom window to frame their movements. And we each took our lead from other participants. So the whole screen became a joyful, organically developing thing. And I'm really happy to say that we are now working with the Place Theatre and Dance School in central London uh, to bring dance properly into our work and have already found so many opportunities and we plan to make a series of videos available online about different phenomena expressed as dance. We always close by bringing the tempo right down and reflect thoughtfully on how atoms shape and, and color our world. And we find that children love poetry and that it's a perfect bridge between knowledge, feeling and meaning. And here we use Richard Feynman's words and discuss what they mean. So there's an element of philosophy and, and, and considering our place in the universe. And we gather their feedback. We ask them what went well and what can we do better? And my favorite answer is, um, is that we did no work all day and also I will remember this day very well I love this picture um, it's an after-school photo and the children are asking what happens when two protons come together and there are so many celebratory thought experiments like this that go on throughout the day Imperial College is building a new campus in Shepherd's Bush um, in West London. And it's a great place to work with families. And you can see, yes, you can see from the picture just how diverse the local community is. And working with children and their guardians seems to bring even greater benefits because everyone goes home to discuss and celebrate what they've learned. In this recent workshop, we zoomed into the laboratories that you saw earlier in the talk. And this dad and daughter team are making prints about the fact that there are one septillion atoms in a cube. And everybody at the workshop actually uh, made a print, made a set of prints about a different aspect of something they'd learnt. And I put everything together into, um, into a little book. So it was very nice that although everyone was working separately, we actually collaborated to make a single thing. And this year, not surprisingly, we've moved most of the workshops online and the children have adapted really well. And we've, um, we've really enjoyed being able to bring colleagues together no matter where they are in the world. And we gather children together by Zoom, as you can see here at home. And we've also explored Zooming right into their classrooms and developed techniques for running workshops with really high levels of, um, of interaction. And here you can see that the children express their ideas in different ways. And um, here they're using um, the idea of a mobile inspired by sculptor Alexander Calder. And this is a mobile about, would you believe, a rock made of flowers. The atoms inside rock are encoded here in this mobile in flowers. And this is an atom absorbing and emitting different colors of light. So the children also learn that atoms have their origins in the Big Bang and extinct stars. So we developed a new online workshop this summer 
about our nearest star, the sun. And in a single session, um, 10 year old children learn the basics about the sun, its size and origins and location. And they explore its surface and dynamical interior and go on to consider its relationship with, with the earth. And we finished with Philip Larkin's brilliant poem, Solar. And the students choose lines they enjoy like suspended lion face or single stalkless flower coined there among lonely horizontals. Our needs hourly climb and return like angels. And they're given a project to make a drawing about an idea that, is, that has captured their imaginations. We usually appear via Zoom on the whiteboard of a classroom and the next session begins with an online art exhibition of their work pictured large and everyone has the opportunity to enjoy and discuss each other's creations. So here Rita paints a beautiful sunset and sprinkles it with light absorbing leaves like, like little boats. And Antonio tells us about the the dynamism on the sun's surface and its turbulent magnetism. Julia, Julia is talking about a host of different light that the sun makes. And Eliza is sharing her thinking on the connection between the sun and the earth and the flow of charged particles that are the, um, the origin of the aurora. I feel really proud about the feedback we've received. Um, the teachers have generously written a lot of helpful feedback for us. And uh, these are some excerpts to give you a flavor. Um, I'm struck by how they recognize that the program is advanced for children age 10 or so. Uh, but uh, there's also the clear recognition that the children know this and they enjoy it and it's being made accessible for them. Um, and that the, the art helps every child express their discoveries and engage in their own way. So from children to grown-ups, I am really excited about engaging the collective energy and creativity of large numbers of people to explore an idea and make something together. And this is an, an area that we are just beginning to explore. And I'm going to share with you our first two experiments. And the first was part of a themed event at Imperial College about temperature. Around a thousand people attended the evening of workshops, displays and talks. Uh, it was December, 2019. And to warm things up, we decided to focus our attention on, uh, on the sun. So light arrives in droplets called, uh, droplets of energy called photons. And this graph shows how many photons of each energy there are in sunlight. The red are the lower energy photons of radio through to infrared and the blue, the higher energy, energy uh, the, the higher energies of ultraviolet through to X and gamma ray. And the colorful band in the middle are the visible light photons that we see with our eyes. And so this is the black body spectrum of the sun shown as a distribution of photon energies. We invited around half the guests, 500 guests, to cut their own photons using the sun as inspiration. And I made this large Matisse inspired poster to, to, um, to encourage everybody. And we discovered that people love to sculpt with paper and work towards a shared artwork. They made so many different things and this visitor was working on tiny infrared photons and cut a pair of sunglasses, a cocktail and a bathing costume. And other infrared photons look like this. There are satellites, uh, leaves, 
sunsets and heat haze. The visible light photons we see with our eyes, with planets, hearts, rockets, and sparkles. And high energy ultraviolet, starbursts, an infinity sign, and a butterfly. And as they cut, as they created and cut, we took off our shoes, picked up glue sticks, and assembled their artworks into this giant three meter square collage. The first ever Matisse inspired photon spectrum of sunshine. And every project like this is a potential step to another one. It gives us new ideas. And so now we wonder about changing this format maybe into a sort of giant teardrop shape, um, a droplet shape or maybe moving into 3D to create a giant mobile. And this is our second workshop, um, a workshop that we did in, in March early this year. And the Imperial College event this time was about data. And we hung a five meter pendulum from the ceiling and invited visitors to, to time the swing. And by doing so, they could begin to investigate how their measurement approach can affect confidence in the end result. And uh, we've already seen that oscillators are an important feature of our world and physicists spend a lot of time measuring them. So the pendulum felt like a, a meaningful choice. Guests took stopwatches and colored note paper and some timed 10 swings and recorded their results on red hued paper some timed two swings and jotted their readings down on blue green sheets. And we collaged each measurement on a big chart. The closed clustering of the red results made over 10 cycles shows a greater agreement and confidence than that of the blue greens made over two cycles. And the color variation on each chart shows a further subtle result according to the point in the swing where people chose to count. People tended to opt for the point of maximum displacement of the pendulum, the extreme of the swing where the bob spends most of the time. But the most decisive moment is at the bottom of the swing. So you can see that the blues measured at the bottom of the swing are more closely clustered than the greens measured, than the greens measured at the edge. So from this beginning, I feel really excited about creating more collective projects and developing this way of working. So I hope you've begun to see that I think there is great opportunity for us to discover new ways to talk about what we know. New conventions for ideas can be discoveries too. So for the last part of my talk, I want to close by returning to a few examples of what's been going on in the studio. And in this small sunshine colored painting about the size of my hand, I took the simplest step to recreate a beautiful graph as a small oil painting. And this is the chart of the temperature of the sun and how it varies from the center to its surface and has this interesting increase just above the sun's surface. This design is about quantum entanglement and is an answer to a question related to something called the quantum eraser and the loss of interference that seems to happen when we try to make a measurement to find out a little bit more about what's going on. My question was, where does the interference go to? And the answer turns out to be that it hasn't gone anywhere at all, and that you just need to see the full picture and consider all possibilities. And this design was our first attempt to reveal this idea, an entirely new convention, which then became a large painting with tens of thousands of triangles. And here is the, the finished piece. It's about 1.8 meters high and it's like, a, it's like a magic carpet. And this is a detail from the middle. 
Each triangle pair is a couple of correlated measurements. The upward triangle is the measurement made on a photon and the downward triangle is the measurement on the atom and the colors are the results. And since then, I've simplified the convention and had great fun experimenting with different color combinations. This magenta combination is inspired by a painting by the artist Annie Albers. And this is magenta with orange and gold, like a sunrise. I have white and gray on blue, like a summer sky. And yellow and blue and red and lime green on a mid green, like the borders of a garden. And in these later designs, every picture has three bands, one, two, and three. The top and the bottom are random mixes of two colors. Nothing special seems to be going on. There are equal numbers of blue and yellow here, and there are equal numbers of lime green and red here. The hidden relation between the two is only revealed in the middle when the top and the bottom designs are brought together and overlapped to show this wavy interference pattern. And so in a nutshell, these designs show how two tiny particles once interacted and now perhaps long separated in space and time, still dance together to a hidden choreography. And they speak more generally, I think, to say that we need to think carefully to consider all possibilities if we're to understand the connections and relations between things. So moving on a little, um, Digital printing on fabric is really quite sophisticated now, and it is lovely to explore taking designs straight out of Mathematica onto silk. And this is the nearest 100 stars on Habitai silk. And here is a scarf of tiny oscillators, which when arranged one next to the other become waves. Their colors inspired by spring flowers. Now, one of nature's most useful and beautiful ideas, we've already touched on them, is that atoms emit atomic spectra. And the precise locations of these lines make the world the way it is and tell us so much about the universe. And we are experimenting at the moment by representing these, these notes of light as sound so that each atom can be played as a tiny musical instrument. I mean, I suggest you visit atomsong.com to have a go, but let me just show you, um, just give you a little bit of a, a sample. So here we are with um, the helium atom. And um, we're looking at this in Google Chrome. So this is an absolute prototype and really only currently works for sure in Google Chrome. And you can basically play the atomic spectra either with your keyboard, uh, like a piano, or with the mouse as a harp. Page through the atoms by just moving the backwards and forwards keys on your keyboard. So there's lithium, nitrogen, beautiful regularity of carbon. Interesting little tune of boron. Brilliant. Simplest and most predominant atom in the universe. Hydrogen. Oxygen. Chlorine, all the reds. Incredible colour of neon. So please have a play and um, 
I'd love to hear your thoughts. Drop me a line. Let me know what you think and it, whether you think it has potential for teaching. Okay, so finally, I'd like to share with you some fun that I've been having in the studio on these dark evenings and I call them light prints. So here are some images of the sun made by gaps between the leaves on trees. And it's a special day because the images are of, an, of a solar eclipse. And this is the essence of the, the pinhole camera. And this picture reminds us how images are everywhere in space and we just need to choose one or more by arranging small apertures and have a surface to project the chosen image onto like the pavement here in the picture. And this is something talked about at length by the artist in residence, Bob Miller at the San Francisco, San Francisco Exploratorium in the, in the 1980s. And the idea that images are everywhere in space is such a surprising and interesting one. Yet we know, it, we know it's true since everywhere we put our eye in space, we see something, we find an image. Anyway, I was inspired to ask the question, could I select images just like the trees? And I made a simple system and uh, a simple system. And here, for example, is, is an image that I've made where I've made an image of a flower and arranged it into a circle. And this is my setup. A light on the far left-hand side here. I've created a simple image, this time just as a bold X. And then I have this um, filter, a selection of holes and a tracing paper screen. And then the image appears here. You just look from here. And these are some of the pictures that I've made. There is so much fun to be had here. Um, here, for example, is a troop of dancers and a sailing boat on a starry night. And here I've returned to the spectra with star people, for we're all made of stardust, looking at star spectra and holding a star on a starry night, for we hold the universe in our hand. So I'm nearing the end of my talk now and I'd, I'd just like to close by mentioning how much there is for an artist to learn from the process of science. And here are just a few um, a few examples of scientific values that I actively embrace in my project. To be focused on nature and, and truly curious um, and to be patient and work over the long term and to work carefully within constraints with determined optimism. And to always try to seek to say something with minimal means. Um, and I think if, if I'm lucky from a specific question, I might discover perhaps universal ideas. Um, and lastly, forever seeking to find greater clarity and form and better forms of expression. Um, and there are a number of factors that I believe a project such as this one can bring to the science and our understanding of nature. And here they are, um, a renewed emphasis on beauty and resonance so that the artwork captures the idea in its form and a spirit of generosity, the vital notion that our beautiful discoveries are for everyone. And so I'm going to close where I began, uh, back in South Kensington in London, and this time in the Victoria and Albert Museum with my, my favorite dancers. Uh, I believe in encouraging every individual to explore, imagine, and say things in their own way. 
And then each idea can become your own and the world becomes more meaningful. Your experiences become richer and you can find your place in the, in the universe. So I hope that you've enjoyed the talk. Thank you so much for listening. And I'm really looking forward to hearing um, some of your questions and comments. Thank you.